And then the parking lots, like I say, I threw acid on cars. Uh, the transportation driver, same thing. Uh, we'd ruin their cars, put sugar in, or, you know, whatever trucks, you know. And uh, uh, that's it. I mean, I, I did a lot of work for him, you know, when I was a kid. In the shadowy realm of organized crime, one figure defied expectations and forever altered the landscape of the mafia. Jimmy the Weasel Freddiano, once an influential American mobster and the acting boss of the Los Angeles crime family, made an unprecedented choice that sent shockwaves through the criminal underworld. Becoming a government witness, Freddiano turned his back on his former associates, breaking the code of silence and unraveling the tightly woven fabric of organized crime. This dramatic turn of events thrust him into the spotlight, as his testimony became a crucial weapon in the fight against the very empire he once helped build. Jimmy was born Aladina Fertiano on November 14, 1913, in a small town near Naples. When he was four months old his mother took him to the U.S., where his father, Antonio, was already living with relatives in Cleveland. His sister Louise was born in 1915 and three years later, his brother, Warren, was born. The family lived in the Murray Hill Mayfield Road district then known as Little Italy, which was also known as The Hill. Jimmy had already witnessed three guys being machine gunned down in the streets when he was only six years old, and his reaction had been awestruck with the words, Holy Mother of Jesus. His father was strict and quick to punish, and the harder his father beat him, the tougher Jimmy got. At school, he was disruptive and got into conflicts with other students and teachers until he was sent to Thomas Edison, a school known back then for bad boys. Jimmy knew the importance of money from a very young age, selling newspapers when he was six and at the age of 11, he was working a six-day week during summer vacations with his father, who was a landscape contractor. At Thomas Edison, he made a lifelong buddy in Louis, Babe, Triscaro, who went on to become a key Teamsters official and the connection between Jimmy Hoffa and the Cleveland Mafia. He started calling himself Jimmy, as Aladina, sounded too much like a broad's name to him. Every time he stole fruit from sidewalk stands, which was frequently, a policeman would chase him. One day, he smacked the policeman in the face with a rotten tomato, and the officer gave chase. Observers gathered, when an old man exclaimed, Look at that weasel run. The police officer noted the nickname in his report, which was then entered into his police file, and the next thing he knew, he became known as Jimmy the Weasel. Jimmy's first experience with bootlegging was at the age of 12. For two years he worked as a waiter in a speakeasy owned by a woman called Bessie, where he would see men come in and drink out their entire wages. The way these men got drunk turned him against alcohol. What bothered him most was not how drunk these men got, but their money. His behavior in school gradually improved and he transferred to Collinwood High School for the ninth grade, but a year later he caught pneumonia, falling into a coma. Two weeks later he regained consciousness, however, again slipping away for another week. When he woke again a week later, the pneumonia had turned into pleurisy, for which his doctor decided that a rib had to be removed by operation. He never returned to school. Although he had received below average marks, he was exceptionally quick with numbers, a skill he had already applied in real life. He met Johnny Martin, a gambler who ran games at Mike's, a Greek restaurant across the street from the number 4 gate of Fisher Body Plant, where he was selling newspapers when he was 14. Martin spent hours teaching Jimmy cheat tricks and the use of shaded dice, and by the age of 17, Jimmy had become Martin's partner at Mike's, receiving an even cut of the winnings. Later, Jimmy made his own games at a friend's house using a portable craps table he had purchased. He would quickly earn three or four hundred bucks, booking games and using the shaded dice. According to the book, The Last Mafioso, 
the treacherous world of Jimmy Frediano, he was 18 years old when he was arrested for raping a 25-year-old divorced woman, but she later confessed that she lied, trying to extort money from Jimmy's father. However, just like the nickname, The Weasel, that charge would stick to his police record. A few days before his 19th birthday, Jimmy and a friend went ice skating at Elysium Park, where he showed off for a girl who was with three other girls and five tough-looking Polish boys. As he was leaving, the five boys attacked him, hospitalizing him as he was badly beaten up. He caught four of them when they were alone with the assistance of his pal Anthony Tony Dope Del Santer, shattering noses, knocking out teeth, fracturing jaws, cracking skulls, and even breaking the arm of one of the boys. Jimmy kept on looking for the fifth boy, who by then, had moved away. It would take him a full year, before he finally conceded defeat. Around the age of 20, Jimmy started booking at the local racetracks and hanging around the clubhouse of the Italian-American Brotherhood on Mayfield Road, run by Anthony Milano, future underboss of the Cleveland family. The Italian-American Brotherhood was the hangout for all the local big shots, where he also got to know the leaders of the Jewish mob, known as the Cleveland Syndicate, which included Mo Dalitz and Morris Kleinman. When Jimmy was a kid, he had the suspicion that there existed some sort of covert Italian organization that was more strong and coherent than the Jews or Irish with whom they collaborated, and back then reference to any crime organization was known as the Combination, and the Combination ruled organized crime in Cleveland at the time. Jimmy started chauffeuring patrons from the east side to the Combination's gaming establishments throughout Cleveland in 1934, after he purchased a two-year-old Marmon limousine. With money rolling in and with his lavish lifestyle, Jimmy turned to golf, where he met the tough Irishman, William McSweeney, who was doing work for the Teamsters Union. Jimmy's first involvement with the union was in their effort to organize the parking lots in Cleveland. Jimmy and his new associates, along with his old friend Babe Triscaro, would march into parking lots and throw muriatic acid on cars while some slashed tires and broke windshields. By the end of 1935, Jimmy went to Florida. On his first day at the local racetracks in the city of Hialeah, Jimmy was introduced to Charles Lucky Luciano. Back home, Jimmy and his friends made the rounds of nightclubs, and there he would meet James Blackie Licavoli. When Licavoli went to Pittsburgh to stay with Mafia boss John LaRocca, Jimmy and Tony Dope met Frank Valenti, who would later become the Rochester, New York, Mafia boss. In 1936, Jimmy met and married Irish-German, Jules Switzer in August, and two months later she was pregnant. In the summer of 1936, Jimmy and his Cleveland friends discovered that it was a lot quicker and far more profitable to rob gambling joints, and Tony Dope Del Santer was ready. Their first job was a poker game, and without disguises, they made out with $5,800 in cash and some jewelry. The next job was picked out by Frank Valenti, and that take was $70,000. The next job was a customer of Cleveland Trust Bank, a man he met at Mike's, who used to draw $25,000 from his bank to cash checks at Fisher Body. Their next victim was Joe Deutsch, a layoff bookmaker, who was too slow in paying off. During the robbery, Tony Dope repeatedly smashed Deutsch's head and blood spattered on Jimmy's clothes. While making their escape, McSweeney, who had borrowed a gun from a friend, refused to get rid of it. Moments later a squad car pulled alongside and a policeman waved them to the curb. Police found McSweeney's gun and later they found Deutsch, who refused to identify his assailants, but the police lab, however, matched the blood. In 1937, a judge handed down 10 to 25 year prison sentences to all three men. In Ohio State Penitentiary, Jimmy met Thomas Yanni Licavoli, who got him a job in the kitchen, and for three years, Yanni was his protector. In 1940, Jewel divorced him and moved with her parents to Los Angeles. Jimmy's father made arrangements for him to be transferred to London Prison Farm, where he spent most days playing softball. Jimmy was released from prison in 1945 and paid a visit to Yanni Licavoli at the Ohio State Penitentiary, who told him that once he was in Los Angeles, to hook up with Johnny Rosselli, 
who at the time was in federal prison at Leavenworth. Jimmy promptly returned doing jobs with Frank Valenti, hoping to save money for his endeavor in California. To satisfy his parole officer, he managed canteens at three factories for Babe Triscaro, who was now the business agent for the truckers local. Jimmy and Jewel remarried before they moved to Los Angeles in June 1946, and on their way there, his wife was unaware of the $90,000 stashed in the trunk of his new Buick. Jimmy's first large-scale operation in Los Angeles was as a bookmaker at the Chase Hotel in Santa Monica. He formed a friendship with Salvatore Dago Louis Piscopo and gradually became friendly with the Dragnas. After two years of his release, in September 1947, Jimmy went to Dago Louis' house and met Johnny Rosselli. Jimmy also met Frank Bomp Bompensiero, who was from San Diego and was in partnership with Jack Dragna in a couple of bars in the city. Not long after, both Jimmy the Weasel and Dago Louis became made men in the Los Angeles crime family. Jimmy met with Mickey Cohen after Jack Dragna asked him for help to pull some of the Italians away from Cohen, particularly Jimmy Regas. Jimmy Regas was the name used by Dominic Bruclier after he joined Mickey Cohen's syndicate gambling operations in Southern California in the 1940s. At the Ocean Park Arena, Jimmy became acquainted with Harry Carl and actress Marie McDonald. In late December 1948, it was diagnosed that Jimmy had a small tubercular spot on his right lung. With the help of wealthy bookmaker, Jack Joseph, who was close friends with Carl and a generous contributor to the City of Hope Charity Hospital, Jimmy underwent an operation. His regular visitors while in hospital included Jack and Tom Dragna, Dago Louis, and Bompensiero. In late 1949, in Las Vegas, Jimmy started spending more time. Following the enactment of a special tax stamp law for gamblers, which required they pay a percentage of their gross, illegal, income to the federal government, many of the wealthiest bookmakers in Los Angeles moved to Las Vegas, setting up shop downtown. A Mickey Cohen bookie, High Goldbaum, took over Grace's dress shop at the Flamingo and turned it into a commission book. In the spring of 1951, Jimmy moved operations to Las Vegas, pulling in thousands of dollars every week but much of it was being divided. Every time he accumulated 100 or 150,000, Jack and Tom Dragna asked that a quarter or a third of it be cut up among them for expenses. What Jimmy found particularly frustrating was that others seldom shared their earnings with the family. In 1951, Anthony Trombino and Anthony Brancato, known as the Two Tonys, held up High Goldbaum's commission book in Las Vegas and fled with $3,500 in cash. They were immediately recognized by Goldbaum, whose former book in Beverly Hills had been robbed so many times by the pair. Arrest warrants were issued and a week later they were apprehended in San Francisco. Out on bail, they skipped to a hideout in Los Angeles. They were hard case shakedown artists and freelance muscle, with police records totaling 46 arrests and 17 convictions, major crimes, from aggravated assault to rape, narcotics, armed robbery, burglary, and countless murder suspicions. A month later, Abe Benjamin, a bookmaker and gambler, told Jimmy that the two Tonys had pulled a fast one on Sam Lazes. They had collected $3,000 from him, money owed to a bookmaking syndicate, but kept the money instead of paying off his bet. Jimmy met with Jack and Tom Dragna at Nick Licata's 5 o'clock club, where Jack said they needed to be clipped. On August 6, 1951, Brancato and Trombino were shot to death about 7.30 p.m. while sitting in the front seat of their Oldsmobile on Ogden Street, near Hollywood Boulevard. The next morning, Jimmy along with his brother Warren, who was staying with him at the time, were arrested. However, six days after the murders, all suspects were released on writs of habeas corpus when police failed to submit sufficient evidence to warrant their arrest. In 1952, the Los Angeles Cosa Nostra family went through another initiation rite, and Jack Dragna promoted Jimmy the Weasel to capo regime.
In 1952, Jimmy met with Bompensiero to discuss plans to murder Frank Borgia, known bootlegger and racket leader. Bompensiero explained to Jimmy that Gaspar Matranga was trying to extort money from Borgia, causing Borgia to lodge a complaint with Dragna. What Borgia didn't know was that Dragna was in on the shakedown. Dragna then ordered Bompensiero to murder Borgia. Bompensiero and Jimmy then killed Borgia with a method Jimmy called the Italian rope trick. Louis Strauss, better known as Russian Louis, had attempted to blackmail Benny the Cowboy Binion, a former Dallas bootlegger and now a Las Vegas developer. Apparently Strauss made threats unaware that Binion had known Jack Dragna for many years. In April 1953, Jimmy enticed Strauss into a setup in California, where Jimmy and Bompensiero turned once again to the Italian rope trick. Jimmy was convicted in 1954 of attempted extortion, for which he would serve six years and three months. Bompensiero would be convicted in 1955 on three counts of bribery in the sale of a California liquor license and sentenced from three to fourteen years in San Quentin. On December 1, 1959, Jimmy was moved to San Quentin for medical attention. Several keloids had to be removed from his chest, which required skin grafting. On his arrival at San Quentin, the first prisoner he recognized was Frank Bompensiero. During the time Jimmy and Bompensiero were in prison, major changes were taking place in the Los Angeles Mafia. Jack Dragna died in 1957 and was succeeded by lawyer-turned-mobster Frank DeSimone. The family, which would become known as the Mickey Mouse Mafia, would grow weaker under his leadership. On July 14, 1960, Jimmy was granted parole. As a further safeguard, Jimmy was restricted to the small northern California town of Redding, where he lived with his wife Jewel. In September he started working for Riley Trucking Company, but within a few months he left that company and landed a job in Eureka with a contractor who needed 25 trucks. Before long, he had independent truckers coming in from Sacramento, Red Bluff, Cottonwood, Marysville, Fresno, and as far away as Knoxville, Iowa. Jimmy's new job scared his ex-employers so much that they began complaining. The adult parole division then informed Jimmy that the Rileys complained that a gangster was running them out of business, and he was told to get out of Reading. Once Jimmy realized that it was inevitable, he moved to Sacramento. Jewel soon joined him, and although he continued to drive a truck 10 hours a day, his primary interest remained in establishing himself as a broker. Jimmy once again managed to prosper, even though his drivers, contractors, and acquaintances were repeatedly interviewed by various law enforcement agencies. In February 1962, he got permission to buy a new home in Sacramento. Early in 1963, he leased a large building for office and garage space at 6929 Power in Road, as well as an adjoining lot, for truck and equipment storage. After three and a half years on parole, Jimmy was discharged on April 7, 1964, and sometime after, Jewel divorced Jimmy for the second time. In 1966, in a waiting room at El Centro Airport, Jimmy met a woman named Jean Bottle. Five people were charged with criminal conspiracy to defraud employees and the state on August 15, 1966, Jimmy, Bompensiero, Diacogianis, Fred Recupido, the subcontractor who brought Jimmy to El Centro, and Jimmy's foreman, Kenneth Bentley. The bail amount for Jimmy and Bompensiero was set at $55,000 each. During the nearly three-month-long preliminary hearing, 66 witnesses would give testimony. On January 5, 1967, a superior court judge ordered the charges against Bompensiero dropped. He would later become an FBI informant, which would cost him his life. Six weeks later, conspiracy charges against the remaining defendants were dismissed. In November, 1967, a federal grand jury issued a 28-count indictment against Jimmy, Jewel, and their trucking company. In June 1968, Jimmy and Jewel were convicted in San Diego Federal Court of one count of conspiracy and 15 counts of filing false statements with the federal government. Jewel and the trucking company were each fined $4,016.
Jimmy was fined $10,000 and placed on three years probation. In 1971 he entered another guilty plea, this time for extortion. On August 28, 1973, Jimmy walked out of Chino State Prison. The Los Angeles Mafia was taken over by Dominic Bruclier when Nick Licata passed away in 1974. In 1975, Bruclier put out a hit on Bompensiero, as a result of Bompensiero's loose lips and his ongoing disparagement of Jimmy and other members of the crime family. In 1975, Jimmy met with Louis Dragna in Ontario, California. Louis Dragna was the acting family boss as Bruclier was serving a prison term. Dragna asked Jimmy to run the family along with him as acting boss. Jimmy agreed on one condition, that he would stay in San Francisco, and that he's not going down there to make money for a bunch of deadheads. The day after his conversation with Louis Dragna, Jimmy boarded a plane for Cleveland where he was met by Tony Dope. That evening, Jimmy had dinner with Leo Mojiri and Tony Dope where he told them about Louis Dragna's proposal. But first, Jimmy went to see Joseph Iuppa to get his blessings, which he did. Bompensiero met Louis Dragna and Jimmy in a restaurant on March 7, 1976, to talk about the family business and the pornographic industry. Bompensiero talked about getting rid of the deadwood in the family, and Dragna twice rebuffed him for his comments. In early 1977, Jimmy walked as an acting boss into a meeting with Bruclier and walked out as a soldier. Almost a year would pass, before Bompensiero would take his last walk. Bompensiero would regularly leave his house in the evening to make and receive essential calls from a payphone. On February 10, 1977, Thomas Ricciardi assassinated Bompensiero then hopped into a getaway car driven by Jack Lochichiro. Bruclier summoned Jimmy to a sit-down and was picked up by Sam Shortino in Palm Springs. Bruclier accused Jimmy of running a separate crew in the Los Angeles Territory and saying that he had a mouth like Bompensiero. Tony Dope and James Licavoli met with Jimmy at Roman Gardens in Cleveland, where they told him that Bruclier was denying that Jimmy was ever an underboss. Tony Dope told Jimmy that Bruclier sent Dominic Longo and Sam Shortino to Detroit to misrepresent him. That same year, Jimmy's longtime friend, Anthony Tony Dope Del Santer, passed away of a heart attack. By October 1977, Jimmy heard rumors that a contract had been put out on his life. He called Louis Dragna for assistance to straighten out any problems with Bruclier, but even Dragna feigned ignorance. Jimmy then tried to acquire the help of Adolf Champ Reynoso, a member of the Mexican Mafia he had met at Chino, to hit Sam Shortino. Irish mobster Danny Green was assassinated by a vehicle bomb in October 1977 outside his dentist's office in the Ohio suburb of Lyndhurst. A short while later, on the basis of an eyewitness's meticulous sketch, Ray Ferrito, a member of the Cleveland and Los Angeles criminal families, was detained for the murder. Ferrito confessed and implicated everybody in the Green murder, including Jimmy. Fearing retaliation, Jimmy consented to testify for the government against the Mafia. In exchange for his evidence, he confessed to several counts of murder and was given a five-year prison sentence, which he completed after serving 21 months of it. In February 1978, Fortiano testified before a Los Angeles grand jury to his knowledge of the activities of the crime family and of Bompensiero's murder. In 1979, Tommy Ricciardi passed away undergoing open-heart surgery. He was the one who informed Jimmy that Lo Cicero had been the driver in the murder of Bompensiero, so his testimony couldn't be used in court. Five high-ranking members of the Los Angeles Mafia, which included Bruclier, Dragna, and Sam Shortino, were found guilty on 11 of the indictment's 22 counts during a three-week trial. Ironically, none of them were found guilty of killing Bompensiero. In 1980, Jimmy entered the Witness Protection Program, however, in 1987, after he published two biographies, was expelled from Witness Protection after the Justice Department noted that it had spent almost $1 million on the Freddianos in 10 years. Jimmy the Weasel Freddiano passed away on June 29, 1993, 
of natural causes.